Hey, what is going on, guys? Today, I thought we'd talk about the fun and sexy topic of grounding your generator. Does it need to be grounded when I'm using an extension cord, or does it need to be grounded when I'm hooking it up to a house? Uh, if you're anything like me, having a visual representation of what's going on with the current flow is essential to your understanding, and that's what I tried doing here is kind of make it a one-stop shop where you can go through, see all the different scenarios uh, with faults included or when it's just working properly and be able to understand when you need a ground rod, when you don't, when you need to be bonded, and when you don't need to be bonded as well. Uh, that's another big thing and a big misunderstanding that a lot of people have. So this video is by no means a substitute with consulting with your local certified electrician. This is for entertainment purposes only, but hopefully by the end of this, you will have a clearer understanding of what's going on with your system and you won't be left in the dark uh, the next time the power goes out. So let's get into it. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions is that grounding, like with a ground rod, is going to protect us from getting shocked if we were to have a fault uh, in our in our system. And that's really not the case. The only way to clear a fault or clearing a fault is the only way for us to not get shocked. Um, like if, if a wire were to come loose in a toaster, so to speak, which we're going to be using throughout our examples. Now, the hardest thing for people to understand is that uh, when it comes to grounding is that there's so many different terms and they are not interchangeable. So we have ground, earth ground, system ground, equipment ground, grounding conductors, grounded conductors. These terms are not interchangeable. They are spe they have specific meanings. And we're going to try to keep this as clear and as concise for the beginner as possible. Um, and let's keep scrolling down. So with system grounding with an electrode, um, basically this is to help provide a path to the earth, so to speak, for high pulse DC current, like from lightning strikes or other freak surges that are just beyond what we normally run through our house. Um, do these protect, does the ground rod protect you from getting shocked? No, um, not in the sense of like, if there was a loose wire in a toaster, no. Um, does it help you from getting shocked if lightning were to hit your house and arc through your house and jump from one pipe to another through a wall or something like that, then yes, this that's what this is intended for. Uh, but it's not to help you from getting zapped if you were to have a problem with your hair dryer or something like that. That's where bonding comes into place. Now, what is bonding? Bonding is the key thing. If you're worried about, do I need to ground my generator to keep from getting shocked? Really what you're wondering is, do I need to bond my generator or have it be a floating neutral generator? That's probably what you're wondering. Now, bonding is when you physically link the ground with the neutral inside of your generator. So the ground wire now provides an alternate path back to the source, the generator, um, if you were to have an issue with um, the current, if you have some abnormality, and that will trip the breaker if you're, if you're bonded properly, that will trip the breaker when it senses that abnormal electricity is flowing and that will stop you from getting shocked. So just a basic, just to keep this in mind, that electricity flows in a circuit or a circle. If you break that circle, basically electricity is kind of backed up. It's got potential, it's waiting to go, but it can't do anything unless it can get back to the, cir uh, to the source. So it leaves the source, goes through an appliance, does work, comes back to the source. If you were to break this wire, and uh, you touch one end of it, as long as you cannot complete the path, nothing's going to happen. But if you were to touch it and you had bare feet and you're standing in a puddle and and it could run through your body, run through the water and somehow make it back to the source, well, then you're going to get shocked. Here's one thing to take out of this video is that in most cases, your generator is already properly grounded according to the NEC, no matter what you're doing. The frame of the generator serves as the ground electrode already. Now, when you're using extension cords, as long as the grounding pins, so right here, the grounding, the one, the little one on the bottom, as long as the pins of that are linked to the ground system in your generator, um, the non-current carrying parts of your generator, like the gas tank, are all linked to the frame, and everything is linked to the frame in the end. So it's all one big ground. They're all connected. Then that is properly grounded. You do not need a ground rod. However, your generator may not be properly bonded when it needs to be. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to be talking about ground rods and bonding and all of the different situations and which one needs which. So let's start off with a floating neutral generator. Floating neutral, what this means is that the neutral here and the ground here are not physically linked in any way. So on this, if everything were working correctly, the electricity would flow through the hot, 
go and do work through the toaster and come back on the blue wire here, which in real life would probably be a white wire, but it'll come back on the neutral and it would complete the circuit and the electricity would just keep flowing in a circle. And I know AC does the back and forth thing. We're just keeping it basic. Now, if we have a floating neutral and we have a fault in the toaster, so let's say the frame of the toaster is now energized. There's a loose wire. It's completely disconnected. Either way, the toaster frame is now energized. You would think, okay, well, will it come back on the ground and trip the breaker? It's not because they're not physically linked. It can't do that. So all you're basically doing is backing up electrons on the toaster frame. It's got potential. It's ready to go. The electricity is also going to have potential in this wire and the frame of the generator will be electrified as well. And nothing's going to trip. But if you don't, if you touch one, touch it and you don't complete the circuit, you won't get shocked. You won't even really know what's going on. But um, there's going to be potential electricity energy ready to go. But it's not going to clear the fault with a floating neutral generator when you're running extension cords. And just pretend this is not three wires. These are three wires within one extension cord leading out. So you naturally think, what if I add a, um, a ground rod? That'll clear the fault, right? No, you're just extending the uh, amount of things that are energized. So the fault's going to happen. It's going to electrify the toaster frame. It's going to electrify this wire. It's going to electrify the frame of the generator. It's going to electrify this wire. It's going to electrify the, uh, the ground rod in the ground. Nothing, again, is going to clear the fault. The electricity, the electrons cannot get back to the source to trip the breaker. So... Nothing's going to happen. You do not need a ground rod in this situation with a floating neutral, but you should be bonded if you're using a, um, an extension cord, but we're going to continue down. So in this situation here, we have a bonded generator and you can see the ground and the frame are all connected. The ground wire, the frame are all connected. That's connected to the neutral. Now you're not going to have a jumper that leads from the neutral to your frame on your generator. It's going to be usually under the uh, alternator cap. Let me scroll down here on um, my website here. You'll be able to see a picture. I added a jumper right here just for grins and giggles to show. Uh, this would be the ground. This would be the neutral. And when you take the end cap off, I put a jumper here. And then you can see that there's continuity now between the neutral prong of the 120 and the neutral prong of the 240 and the ground lug there. If you were to take that jumper out, it would be a floating neutral generator, and then you would not have continuity. It would just say OL or open line on the multimeter. So in this situation, though, we have a bonded generator. If everything's working correctly, again, the electricity flows out, and then it comes back through the uh, neutral, and everything is just as it should be. If we have a fault with a bonded generator, the here's going to be the big difference in what protects you from getting shocked. The electricity is going to flow out, it's going to energize the frame. It's going to travel back, though, through the ground. It wants to come back at the ground really fast. It'll come back on the frame. It'll connect up through and to the um, neutral because everything is linked inside the generator now physically with a jumper. And once it completes the circuit, the circuit breaker inside of the generator itself recognizes, hey, there's abnormalities here. We have an excess of power or electricity because the electricity went out and it came back and it didn't do any work and it will trip um, the breaker. And that will protect you from getting shocked. Now, here's where adding a ground rod could actually be, be detrimental to you. If you have a bonded generator, like in the example above, which already protects you from getting shocked and it's already grounded according to the NEC, we now decide we want to add a ground rod. What could go wrong, right? Well, if you add the ground rod, you have that same fault. The electricity is going to, and you touch the uh, toaster, the electricity can flow through you, through the ground, because the ground rod now makes a voltage gradient coming out. It'll flow through you, through the ground, up through the ground rod, through the wire there, to the frame, link back up with the neutral, and you get a zap. So when using an extension cord, do you need to be bonded? Yes, you should be bonded. That's what protects you from getting shocked. Do you need a ground rod? No, you do not need a ground rod with a floating neutral or with a bonded uh, generator when you're using extension cords. It's not needed. It does not protect you from getting shocked in any way. And then if you use uh, a bonded generator, it actually increases your likelihood of getting shocked. So do not use a ground rod with, a, with extension cords and a floating neutral or a bonded generator. Now we're going to jump into transfer switches and um, kind of just did a little demonstration here. Hopefully this makes sense to you, but 
this is with the generator being off right now. We have a floating neutral generator. The neutral and the ground are not linked in any way. Um, there is no ground rod. And we have the incoming service here from your power utility that runs through the transfer switch and then it's gonna go down to your breaker box, which is down here. And then it leads out on a circuit to your toaster and back. And everything's working as it should in this situation. You'll notice with most transfer switches though, right here is gonna be the key part. That's why I made that one black. Uh, the neutral is kept intact between, if you were to hook up a generator, the neutral stays intact with the house. It's not switched over. And that'll make sense to you in just a second. All right, now we have a normal transfer switch and the generator is turned on. And when we turn the switch in the transfer switch, what that does is it, is it moves um, the connections here on the two hot leads. So up here, the two hots, uh, we're gonna hook up obviously with a 240 volt cord. So the two hots, uh, in this situation, when it was off, they weren't connected. Now, in this case, they are connected. So the transfer switch on most of these transfer switches will switch over just the hots. It leaves the neutral intact. So this is all kind of hardwired in. So now the incoming service isn't doing anything with the hots and the generator is supplying all of the power to the toaster. Um, the red one is just gonna go off and do its own thing with other circuits. The black one's gonna come down and that one will be allocated for the um, toaster. The electricity will flow back through the neutral to the source and that's what it wants to do. Now here's where things get a little fun. What if we were to have a fault in the toaster again? What if the frame of the toaster were energized? Uh, we saw from the examples above, everything wants to get back to the source, right? So it's it can't travel on the neutral coming back. So it's gonna have to go up through the ground, the ground wire. It's gonna go back to the breaker box. It's gonna then go up to the transfer switch. It cannot go directly over to the generator because the generator is a floating neutral generator and it does not uh, have a connection directly between the neutral and the ground. So you're thinking, well, how do we clear the fault? We're just gonna get shocked, right? Well. Here's the cool part is that in a system, you only want your system to be bonded in one place. You don't want the generator to be bonded because it's already sharing a neutral with the house. When it's plugged in, it's pretty much hardwired into the neutral. So it shares that system. The house is already bonded itself at the uh, first disconnect. So it'll travel up the ground, up to the transfer switch, over to the first disconnect. It'll then link up here at this jumper right here. It'll link up with the neutral and then head back over to the generator. And then this will clear the fault. So when you have a regular transfer switch, here's the basic rule. When you have a regular transfer switch that keeps the neutral intact and it does not switch the neutral specifically to the generator, it keeps it intact with the house and the generator all hardwired in, then, and that's gonna be most transfer switches, then you do not need a ground rod and you do not want to be bonded because if you were to bond between here and here, you now have two paths for the current to travel. It can come up and go over to the first disconnect and back to the generator, or it can come simply up here directly to the generator. And you're gonna have current flowing where it shouldn't. You shouldn't have like a circuit within a circuit. You just want the one. So you only want it bonded in one place. So keep your generator without the ground rod. You don't need it because the house already has a ground rod and then you don't need a jumper to make it bonded. The next slide is gonna be a switch neutral transfer switch. Now this one, the generator's off and you see the hots are coming in from the main, uh, main incoming service. And then the neutral as well is strictly on the main service and everything's working as it should. There is a bond uh, from neutral to ground at the first disconnect. There's a ground rod and then since we're using a switch neutral transfer switch, we want a generator that has its own ground rod and you're gonna have to check with your local laws and see how long of a ground rod it needs to be and how far away from another ground rod it needs to be. And you're also gonna want a um, generator that's bonded. Because when we come down here and we switch the neutral and the hots over to the generator specifically, now you see the hots here from the incoming service, they're not connected anymore to anything. It's just the generator running the show on the specific circuits that you've allocated. So everything, as long as there's no problems, everything's running fine. The electricity, electricity comes out through the generator, through the transfer switch, down through the breaker box, into the toaster, back on the neutral, and it completes the circuit, and you're all good to go. If you were to have a fault, um, it's going to travel uh, from the toaster to the ground, up here to the transfer switch, 
over to the generator and link back up because you have the jumper here. It completes the circuit. Everything is good to go because it doesn't share the main neutral anymore with um, the first disconnect. And then according to the NEC code, because the generator is now not just sitting out in a field and powering something with an extension cord, it is now affecting the wiring in your house. There's much more liability with things like that, uh, with arcing of lightning and everything. Because uh, your generator is hooked up to the house, you do now need a ground rod when you have a switched neutral transfer switch. When it's not sharing the neutral anymore with the house, it severs that connection and everything's running strictly off of the generator. The generator becomes a separately derived system. It's no longer sharing that neutral with the house. You now need a ground rod and you need it to be bonded as well to keep you from getting shocked if you were to have a fault in the system. Now this slide just shows exactly what I had kind of described above. We have a transfer switch, a normal one that keeps the neutral intact. We have our generator on, there's a fault, but it's improperly set up with this bond here. Same thing, the, if there's a fault and this is energized, it'll go up through the ground and it'll come over to the generator and then link up with the neutral, but it'll also come up here over to the main disconnect up this jumper and back through the neutral here. And again, you have current being carried on the neutral back and you have current being carried through the ground back to the source. And you don't want current divided up on two different paths. It's not, that's against all code and um, don't do it. The ground is an emergency path back to the source. It is not meant to be pulling current through it nonstop to complete a circuit. I have my website here. You can check this out. I have a long, lengthy post that kind of goes over everything from start to finish. It's for the beginner. If you just kind of want a synopsis or a, a recap of what's going on, I have a link right up front at the top here. You can read a condensed version as well, but there's a lot of visuals on here to help you keep track of what you need to do. Um, generator type, floating neutral bonded, unbonded, what you do with extension cords or powering a house, how you should use things and whatnot. A lot of visuals that'll help you out when speaking to your um, local certified electrician and before you get started with anything. So if you're unsure or uncertain about what you're doing, please reach out and get some help. This is just to kind of bring you up to speed and show you um, that things don't have to be overly complicated. It's just when you look online and you're like, do I need to ground my generator? Everything that you see is basically an electrician speak. You don't get a clear cut answer. And this will give you the four main scenarios using uh, extension cords with a bonded or floating neutral gener generator or powering a house with a floating neutral or a bonded generator, what you need to do and when. The only time you need a ground rod is when you are using a switched neutral transfer switch, um, which switches the neutral in the house over to the generator itself. The generator is now a separately derived system. It needs a ground rod and the generator also needs to be bonded in that case. If you're using a normal transfer switch, you want a generator that is floating neutral and no uh, ground rod. If you're using extension cords, you want a bonded generator, but you do not need a ground rod with either one. So hopefully this helps you out. I will have all of my resources below that you can check out. I highly recommend checking out Mike Holt's information here. Um, I have a link to it in my uh, blog post that you can check out here where the timestamps and what you should check out. Um, I have... Um, I believe his name's Ben. I forget right offhand. I'm sorry if this is you, Ben. Um, but this is excellent in understanding floating neutral and bonded neutral. And then the uh, grounding myths here um, from Mike Holt is just astounding. So many things that you've probably heard in your life are wrong, and it'll blow your mind, um, your understanding of electricity. But anyways, take it easy, guys. Hopefully this helps you out with the visuals, and um, have a great day. Thanks for the view. Thanks for watching. And if this helped you out, feel free to subscribe and uh, stay tuned for more.